Hi guys, I'm Mike and this is F1 Fanatics. Welcome back to another F1 Worldwide The Fan Podcast where we kind of talk to fans across the world and after the past couple uh, being back in the UK closer to home we now go over to Indonesia where we have Viandra uh, coming on as a guest regularly kind of chat with him on Twitter and kind of he is actually the inspiration for where this podcast actually came from because he was like oh I'd, I'd love to come on a podcast sometime and talk about F1 one so uh thank you very much for giving me the inspiration for the idea and welcome to the show uh there guys um yeah i didn't even know that i was the inspiration for this one uh but uh yeah it's uh, nice to be here and uh nice to be back on uh, youtube for uh, for a while yeah uh, though of course uh i'm not working this time so it's a bit more relaxed it's nice and easy. All you have to do is sit back and talk F1. And that leads us on to our topic of the day. And our topic of the day, this will be coming out to you. We, we are filming this in December, so it might feel a bit weird. But as the decade ends and the new one has begun, this will be coming out to you on the 2nd. Uh, it is the 2nd today of January, which means that we are in a new decade. And today we are going to look back at the past decade and discuss what is the best season? So we're going to discuss the three... Well, there's four contenders for us. Two we agree on, which is the 2010 and 2012 season. Then I'm going to pitch the 2016 season. And Viandra is going to pitch the 2019 season before giving our concluding thoughts. So we will start off with the 2010 season. And um, why do you think the 2010 season was so good? For me, it's uh, so good because I think um, we have, I think, uh, five drivers pretty much fighting for the championship the whole season. Four of them come down to the last race. And um, we have many uh, great races as well. And, of course, um, uh, three back market teams, <laughs> which are unfortunately all of them extinct now. But, uh, and also, oh yeah, and also, of course, 12 teams, 24, grid, 24 drivers. A lot. Yeah, it it was a lot of uh, drivers on the grid. I, I think that point of you had five drivers competing for the title um, right up until the last race and it was exciting. And actually, for one of the races <laughs> at Abu Dhabi, it was an exciting race. Obviously, it knows it gets exciting, but that season finale where Fernando couldn't make his way up the field was leading the championship going in the race and Sebastian Vettel, for the first time, having not led the championship all year, managed to secure his uh, first world championship and was the youngest world champion at that stage. So that was pretty impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, he did clinch the... Uh He's still to this day still the youngest uh, championship. If uh, if Max, I think I think Max can still broke it, but he needs to win it. Uh, I think next year. Yeah, Max mistaken. Max needs to win it next year. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that that race. Yeah, I, I still watch that race. Of course, being the Ferrari fan, uh, you know, I was watching that race. You know, I thought like, you know, when uh, Ferrari, of course, uh, called in Fernando to cover off of of course uh, Weber. If you don't know, because Weber actually also pitted. And, you know, Ferrari called Fernando to, to of course, uh, cover him off. And he thought, oh, you know what, he can just pass these guys because he's slower. But turns out, uh, lap by lap, it's, um, it seems unlikely. And, of course, being the Ferrari fan, I was uh, quite upset, even though not not a uh, not an Alonso fan. But, yeah, uh, I was quite upset on that one. And, uh, yeah, that just, um, yeah, so it's a very uh, tense finale for sure. But not the one that I will, um, probably I will, uh, not my favourite, like, but hey, at least it's not as uh, worse as 2008. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but even then, Ferrari already budget uh, strategy since the start of the decade. My God. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you just have to look back and you look at 2019 and you look at Ferrari's strategy and you go, oh God, what has changed? 
we, we, we've had <laughs> 10 years of racing now and what has changed in Ferrari's strategy? Oh, God. I, in fairness, there have been some good and positives within that, but, yeah, as a whole, there. And it got it wrong on the day. Obviously, mucked up Fernando's race and, yeah, it proved why, well, we saw in the most recent Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, didn't we, with... Um, team drivers struggling to get past each other without drs and it almost brought back memories of that 2010 with obviously no drs being which made overtaking very yeah, difficult yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was crazy on that front but I, I think also within that there was a load of drama that the mclarens were in it but they just had a really unreliable car didn't they and it was it was exciting having for the first time the double brick lineup in lewis hamilton and jensen button and that was a really exciting partnership, oh, yeah, wasn't that. it? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, especially Button, who had a great start to the season, actually, because I think he got two wins out of four in the first uh, uh, first four races. Especially in Austra Australia, that was that was a brilliant win for me. Uh, especially with the whole. Um, okay, that might be going a uh, slight off topic here, but uh, might. Okay, you know, uh, I'm gonna explain that one later on why I think that was a great try from uh, Button in that race. Uh, but yeah, but. Yeah, that was a uh, very um, okay. I, I hope I hope this doesn't um, uh, offend people, but uh, quite a Brexit lineup. <laughs> uh, I hope, please, I hope, please don't, don't kill me, please, Britons. Uh, I'm not. I love British. that the Brexit lineup. Um, <laughs> Britain against the world. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Please, please, no hate, please, okay? Uh, yeah, but uh, it was a very exciting love, uh, a very uh, world champion material lineup. Hamilton, of course, did actually let the championship uh, for some while until um, until he had, um, I think, two consecutive DNFs in uh, Monza and Singapore, and that sort of uh, tail him off a bit. Yeah, I, but yet, I, despite that, he still he still has an outside chance. So, yeah, he was he was the so, uh, most outside off. chance, and Jensen yeah, Button. Well to stay in it. Yeah, Button was ruled out before the last race, wasn't he? Um, with some issues, the McLarens were very good up until the yeah. first half of the season, and then the second half they just really dropped off with reliability issues, didn't they? Yeah, it's more of like I don't know. I. I... I don't. I don't remember any reliability issues uh, from them that season. But it's sort of like, I don't know, like um, they sort of dropped off the pace a bit. Like Button was like literally nowhere in Singapore and Japan really. Uh, Korea, he had a didn't really have a good race. I think if I'm not mistaken, he finished outside the points in that race. If I'm not mistaken, you know Hamilton finished uh, second. To be fair, which is probably why he he stays in the championship. But Button, I think after the penultimate round, was out of the championship. I think after the penultimate round in Brazil because he finished literally behind all of his title rivals. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so... But it was still, like, an interesting lineup for McLaren on that front. And then, obviously, you know, we, we've spoken about Fernando a bit there, but it, the Red Bulls, it was, it was their first year. They'd shown signs of it in 2009, obviously being Braun's closest uh, rivals in that season. But they really start to get the dominance and it was the Aussie grit of Mark Webber, the kind of old journeyman of F1 by that stage, wanting to take his uh, chance. And then Sebastian Vettel, uh, the young kind of exciting talent fighting each other. And obviously um, it was the start of, uh, yeah, the kind of, what should we call it? Uh, frictioned relationship between the two. Uh, from there, it, it was certainly interesting, and Mark Webber kind of blew his shot when he DNF'd in Korea, didn't he? Yeah, he was he was in the championship of that race, I think, if I'm not mistaken, running in second under uh, uh, heavy heavy rain, and then spun. At, I can't remember. I think he. I can't remember what turn, but he, he spun, hit the wall, and then uh, collected uh, a certain uh, German YouTuber who's now basically a. Um, uh, Living his life with uh, his family and with uh, getting those YouTube uh, pennies. So uh, <laughs> you'll probably guess which one it is. But uh, yeah. Nico Rosberg. <laughs> and he's. That, background. 
first first year exactly uh first year at mercedes wasn't it as well actually so um I, yeah actually 2010 yeah, it, it is it is it is and his teammate is, of course, uh, Michael Schumacher, is, uh, who basically makes his uh, Formula 1 comeback. Yeah. Exactly. So that that was fantastic to see as well. And obviously, Mercedes, um, they didn't carry on the success that Braun had the season before. But it was uh, exciting, obviously, for the first time since the 1950s, uh, where they pulled out of all motorsport. Um, it was exciting to see Mercedes as a works team back in Formula 1 as well. Yeah, you know, the last, of course, as you can tell, last time they were in the Formula One was in the 50s when uh, uh, Ma- Juan Manuel Fangio was uh, winning for them. Uh, but yeah, of course, uh, Mercedes, of course, got uh, brought, of course, by, um, well, they brought Braun GP. Uh, and of course, they decided to um, to make Michael Schumacher return uh, to uh, to the grid. Not that he's the same, but it's a, it's a pleasure seeing a legend um, coming back to the, to the sport. He really, um, he had a bit of an average season. He, a uh, few races, he was uh, just uh, knocking on the podium. He was just knocking on opponents in a few races. But mostly he was uh, pretty much in the midfield for most of the uh, season and uh, was pretty well beaten by Rosberg. But yeah. of course, it's, uh, it's kind of inevitable because he was like 41 at the time when he returned. So he, he did have lost a bit of an edge, uh, does he? And we all know he's, it's probably not the same not going to be the same story that we always used to see from Michael. Yeah, and also sad, also he kind of... That's the reality, I guess. Like, yeah, he'd, he'd been outside the sport a little bit as well, and so things had changed. There had been rule changes as well, obviously, in 2009, um, which those things do affect it because the cars are different so therefore the cars are different to handle they didn't have as much testing as what he usually had in his first time round um and obviously age had caught up with him you know reactions are slower uh, there's new hot shots on the grid um but it was still impressive the fact that he returned and i think the next season that we'll talk about uh he had a very impressive performance as well uh within that so um yeah I, I think we've probably summed up the 2010 season pretty well I, I think probably the highlight of it we would say is for the majority of the season there were five drivers competing for the title and it was just exciting from race to race yeah yeah exactly like i i still think uh the best race of that season was actually in Aust- australia and uh i know australia uh, the Alba Pass Lucky has been getting uh, so much uh, crap these days because, my God, it is so dull and it really is so hard to overtake in that circuit. But I, but people forget during those times, Australia was mostly a very chaotic race, races, especially 2010 was just one of them. Uh, you know, with um, with the start when uh, uh, Felipe uh, um, jumped from um, started like in the third row, jumped all the way to second, uh, and then we have I think uh, Schumacher, Button, and Alonso having an incident going to turn one with uh, Button uh, basically touching uh, Fernando, and then which basically spun Fernando and basically drove him into uh, Schumacher, and then which resulted in Schumacher in a damaged front wing, which basically ruined this race pretty much. He still finished in the points, but it pretty much ruined his race and then it's pretty much just um, mixed conditions from then on and then of course uh, going back to the button situation where uh, he put on the dry tires much earlier than everybody else uh, now many people thought it's a big mistake because well he gone off at I think turn three I think if I'm mistaken gone to the gravel so People thought, oh, oh no, it might be a big mistake. But of course, as Button actually turned out, he said in an interview, by the way, this it's only the turn three that is wet. So basically, kind of like he tricked them, tricked all everyone into thinking, oh, it's not yet, even though it is already dry enough. He just, it's just that turn is uh, still wet. And of course, in the end, he went on to win that Grand Prix. Though you can say he got a bit lucky because, well, Seb was leading the race at one point, uh, at that point, and then he. And of course, got off with a brake failure, and then pretty much most of the battle was actually behind uh, Jensen throughout that whole race. 
And of course, in the end, it was um, Robert Kubica uh, went to finish sec- second in that race, and then uh, the second Ferrari driver in Felipe Massa finished uh, third in the end. Yeah, it was it was a brilliant race, and it was a brilliant start to kind of um, kick off the season and to kind of what would yeah. ensue from there. And and Button himself is a very good wet weather driver, and he's a very good driver at knowing his tyre selection in those sort of conditions. He's um, notably through a few of his races um, been able to kind of select the right tyre at the right time. Um, but yeah, it was massively impressive on that front. Um, so I think we'll move on to 2012. So this comes in to our second contender. And um, this was obviously another one where we had a title fight uh, between Vettel and Alonso. Very close, again going to the last race. This time it was in Brazil, the season finale. And uh, yeah, that was that was a fantastic season. It was the first season where we had a new record of six world champions competing on the grid in Schumacher, Raikkonen, Alonso, Button, Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel, of course. Um, so that was fantastic. And also the start of the season was chaotic because we had seven races and uh, seven different race winners, including one Pastor Maldonado at the Spanish Grand Prix, um, which, yeah, was pretty crazy on that front. Um, but, yeah, w- what were your thoughts on the 2012 season? Oh, yes. Oh, this is finally something I've been wanting to talk about for, a whole, for like, the whole time. Okay. Uh, 2012 in general was just an amazing season because it literally has everything you just want from uh, from a racing season pretty much from having multiple stories to you know chaoticness as you can tell with the first seven different winners with including of course Pastor Maldonado um, you know you know of course craziness happened a lot uh, you know n- nobody knew who's going to win um for most races and we have like at least around four or five races that would probably be one of the best uh, in F1's history like for example of course uh, the last race of the season which still to this day is, is my favourite ever Grand Prix because simply because I remember pretty much everything from that race <laughs> but uh, yeah of course as you can tell with the six different champions including of course the return of the Iceman in uh, Kimi Raikkonen who pretty much carried that Lotus team for most of the season while his uh uh, French teammate was uh, make, getting incidents in um, yeah, with pretty much every driver. <laughs> oh, oh it, my God. Uh, it probably was Roman's yeah. worst season, in fairness, from there. And that obviously is the season that he picked up the race ban. And, um, well, one of the controversial incidents obviously may have ultimately cost Fernando the title in terms of uh, the crash that happened in Spa, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was a uh, that was a big moment, and that was actually after the summer break, if I'm not mistaken. It, it was. Uh, you know, going to turn one, which uh, Hamilton Grosjean battling. You know, he squeezed uh, Hamilton, and just pretty much craziness happened, and then he pretty much yeah flipped over Alonso, which just about misses his head. That was a uh, pretty lucky. Uh, Alonso was pretty lucky to get away with that one. It was very lucky because uh, yeah, yeah, it was obviously the days um, prior to the halo. And so, yeah, yeah. it was very scary incident yeah. indeed. Yeah, yeah, it is, very, it is indeed. Uh, but, yeah, but even in that race, there's actually still some crazy, despite having, I think, um, four contenders uh, got out of that race because, not mistaken... Out of everyone on the front runner, if I'm not mistaken, only Button actually made it through the corner without seeing the chaos because, of course, he started from pole position that race. Yeah, I, I believe uh, so because, obviously, Grosjean mm-hmm. went out, Hamilton was involved in it, Alonso went out, and Sergio Perez were the ones who were immediately taken out by the incident. Yeah, yeah, his his front wing got uh sorry his rear sorry not front wing <laughs> his uh, rear wing got uh, taken off completely and of course uh, you can't forget uh, Kamu Kobayashi's will start in the front row in that race had yes. a terrible start and basically well he he's the one who actually he's the sole survivor of that because he only got I think a damage um, 
and play in the end. Though, yeah, of course, which... the reason why he got into that accident is because of that of that terrible start. Yeah. But he can count himself lucky that he was actually able to finish the race for it. But yeah, Spa was an yeah. interesting instant from there. Uh, but it also saw, I think we have to talk about that pole position, Michael's last ever pole position at Monaco was an absolute brilliant lap in the Mercedes, wasn't it? Oh, oh yeah, that was, that was, that's for me one of Michael's probably best, um, best uh, moments in his career. Just because, you know, well, it's a quote unquote last pole position. It, of course, didn't turn out to be a pole position because he got a five plus grip penalty for basically uh, punting off Bruno Senna, the previous race in Spain. So yeah, that was a uh, that was pretty unfortunate. But uh, yeah, of course, Mark Webber in the end got pole. But of course, Schumacher did set the fastest uh, time in the session. And you know, I still see that lap till then. Just and just uh, you know, just watches like he he really does. Despite him being, I think, forty three at that time, the old man really still got it. Uh, you know, at, at at times, and you know, it brings us back memories from his you know. In his, pri- uh, in his prime, pretty much. Yeah, and that was probably followed by um, a brilliant uh, podium that we then had later on the season in terms of uh, Ferrari <coughs> ex-drivers. In terms of, it was the European Grand Prix where we had Alonso was the first one to win two races in the season. And I believe we had a podium yeah. of Kimi Raikkonen and Michael Schumacher, didn't we? I believe yeah, that was the yeah, podium. We, yeah, we did get it. Which, yeah, that what a great podium of ex-Ferrari that was. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really is. You know, that, that race is uh, so many. Once again, just like Brazil 2012. Crazy shit happens uh, a lot in that race. So of course, Alonso won that from... Uh, uh, I hope you don't forget for that, this. Or if you... Well, I don't know if you remember about this, but he actually started that race in P11. So he got knocked out in Q2. And despite that, he still went on to win. Yeah. And of course... Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, Schumacher, of course, started in Q2 has uh, only got into Q2 as well. I think he started around... P13, I think, it just like two positions back from Lonzo, and of course went on to uh, finish that because of the, well, basically because of the amount of chaos that is in front of him. Like, I can literally just name some of the chaos that happened during that race. From, of course, like you already said, from Alonso's uh, win from 11th on the grid to, of course, uh, Sebastian Vettel and Romain Grosjean getting alternator failures, uh, Lewis Hamilton and Pastor Maldonado tangling on the last. No, no, actually, on the penultimate lap, which, of course, gave Schumacher that podium. Uh, and, of course, uh, Bruno Senna with that uh, half spin, uh, being, I think, after tangling with Kobe Kobayashi. So, yeah, <laughs> my God, yeah, that's the amount of uh, crazy shit that happened in the, uh, during that race. Yeah, it was, it was a mental race. And I think 2012 had a lot of great races uh, like that because you also... There was the Malaysia rain-affected race wasn't there. <coughs> and <coughs> I w- I'm not sure. I'm convinced it is. Is Malaysia the one where Sergio Perez actually secured second? His uh, what highest ever finish, his first podium. And obviously at Sauber's, I think still to this date, best ever finish within a Grand Prix. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're correct on the whole Sauber thing, but yeah, you're right. Sergio Perez did get on the podium in uh, Malaysia, and he actually almost got the win from Fernando Alonso. W- once again, brilliant drive from him in that race. Uh, Perez was actually very close to Alonso for like literally most of the race. He was closing and closing in before making a mistake on the penultimate corner, which eventually, of course, yeah, fuck it, well, just we'll just settle for a second, and he did. He only finished three seconds behind Alonso. Yeah, I, again, I think it might have been even closer. Ferrari th- struggle at the start of the season. People forget how that car was shit at the start of the season. Yeah. Of course, it got better in the end, but... but yeah, the, um, the Ferrari yeah, car... The Alonso was able to win that. Yeah. And it's still, in my opinion, one of his best wins. I, I think... I think that Ferrari car, 
and um, how Alonso got it to compete for a title could arguably be Alonso's best ever season. Obviously, you know, he won two world championships, so it's difficult to argue against those. But um, yeah, it was just absolutely incredible drive by him. Yeah, I agree. I think I still think that is his best season, just because you know Ferrari for like the first I don't know, I guess four races he was a quite a dog of a car until like around Spain where they got the upgrades and that's where the car got uh, a bit better in the end. Mostly became like the fourth or third best car for most of the season. And if Alonso was able to just you know go manage to get of course another two wins and um, just being probably the most consistent driver of the grid because he's pretty much getting podiums. Most of I'm pretty sure he finished on the podiums, I think, 14 times um, uh, out of uh, 20. And I'm pretty sure after, um, after, if I'm not mistaken, after uh, from Spain, I'm pretty sure he only got outside the podium, I think, only, if I'm not mistaken, it's only uh, th- four times, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I know he got off the podium in um, uh, Canada. Um, Spa, obviously. The two DNF, the two DNFs in, uh, of course, uh, Spa and Suzuka. Yeah, actually, you're. It's actually three. My no, actually, uh, Hungary. Yeah, Hungary. Where he finished uh, fifth as well. Fifth. Yeah, so Alonso only pretty much got off the podium four times after from Spain when Ferrari got that car upgraded. So yeah, I mean, it was or... it was incredibly oh, consistent yeah, okay. uh, from Fernando. Yeah, finishing on the podium, just so, and that's how he kept that car in contention. He didn't necessarily get a massive amount of race wins during that year, but he just kept getting consistent high points finishes to kind of get himself in a sniff. And the Suzuka one actually was a major one as well. As much as obviously Spa was not his fault, being in a good position. Suzuka was a rare driver mistake from Alonso, which obviously um, gave Vettel the lead in the championship. And Vettel never um, kind of gave up that lead again into the season. And I think that's probably what we talk about the highlight was that um, uh, championship fight between Vettel and Alonso kind of bouncing back and forth throughout the season. And obviously acclimatising into that final race in Brazil. So what was your thoughts on the um, fight between Vettel and Alonso? Uh, it was a very uh, intense fight, pretty much. Alonso, of course, leading the championship after that, uh, of course, that Valencia win. He was pretty much leading the championship all the way until, of course, uh, I think uh, Suzuka. Uh, of course, Vettel did, uh, did get the championship back, but only, um, I think, after... Uh, uh, after Korea, uh, of course, is done, where he actually got in front by six points because after Suzuka, Vettel actually, well, before the start of Suzuka, he was 29 points behind Alonso. And, of course, when it finished, he was only four points because, of course, Vettel won that race dominantly. And uh, Alonso, uh, and he was only four points behind Alonso. And, of course, in the end, Seb had, that, had an amazing run of form from Singapore all the way until... India, pretty much the Asia rounds, he was unbeatable in those Asia rounds, and ultimately I think that's that's really the difference uh, on why Sepp won the championship, because that amazing, uh, of course, uh, Asia rounds where he won four consecutively, because uh, it might be surprising, but before Singapore, he actually won one race, and of course he was in the title because of course uh, consistency, but for most of the year, he was actually didn't have the best car, and of course, Red Bull only have the best car pretty much uh, from the Asia round. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think that's the difference on how Seb won that championship in the end. Yeah, of the I think Asia uh, run. I think you very much saw from Vettel uh, in that is what we see from Lewis Hamilton now in modern day. Um, where when it comes to the business end of the season, they switch on and they just get the results that they need um, to secure it. And then obviously in Brazil was absolutely fantastic because uh, to stand a chance, Alonso needed to finish on the podium. And so obviously his race was fine. Um, 
did he actually finish off the podium in the end? Did he finish fourth, or did he sneak onto it? I can't remember. No, 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 no. He actually, he actually did get on the podium. He finished, yeah. I think, uh, second in the end. Even though uh, without the uh, incident between Hockenheim and Hamilton, he probably would have finished outside the podium actually. But yeah, but yeah, he did actually get on the podium. But of course, wasn't enough because here's the thing: uh, Seb uh, got taken out in the first corner but despite that he's still able to come back and finish sixth and in the end of course won the championship by just three points yeah and it was a fantastic drive um by Vettel as well because literally that spin on the track he was facing the wrong direction just completely wrong you just think he's gone completely to the back of the grid was just mental kind of uh how he managed to work his way through the field. Yes, the Red Bull was a very good car at that stage, but still was a mightily impressive uh, race from Sebastian Vettel. And he well and truly earned that world championship with that last race performance. Yeah, he, he really did. Uh, you know, of course, still, you know, still not happy because, well, another title being slipped away from Alonso's fingers. I mean, especially that face in the air at the park for me. Oh my god, that is that is like so hard. But that, that's that's uh, the a face of a man that just cannot catch a break. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, great finale indeed. Especially he was still able to come back despite having a floor damage for pretty much most of the race. After that, you know, when he was tangled on the first lap, he had the uh, floor damage for most of the race, and yet despite that, he still came back. You know, just once again, show why Seb is a worthy world champion despite. Nowadays, he's uh, very uh, mistake-prone, which is kind of sad, really, to see a four-time world champion being, you know, this uh, error-prone. Yeah. Uh, obviously. I, I, I think... Um, <laughs> yeah. Very, he's very, he's very, never very, really... Yeah. The move to Ferrari was a romantic one, and um, uh, I think he's never... Ferrari and him have never really linked up in a car that perfectly suits Sebastian like they did in the Red Bull days and then competing against the Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton who are just an efficient machine he has just yeah had to push further which when you push harder than you normally do it means that mistakes usually follow but 2012 was an absolutely fantastic season a fantastic title battle fantastic races within that loads of drama um, along it it was uh, the longest race calendar up until that it was the first year that um, 20 races were introduced onto the calendar as well so uh, yeah but we'll now move on to the uh, dispute section where we'll have <laughs> you pitch 2019 why that that's a contender yeah. for one of the uh, seasons of the decade and then I'll pitch 2016 okay so um, for 2019 uh, for me, in terms of the championship, it's really, really um, not really a great one. I mean, to be fair, it's a dull one. It's pretty much already over after uh, Paul Ricard, really. Uh, because, well, at that time, Hamilton, I think, already won six out of... No. Wait. wait. Yeah, I think he won, I think, six or seven of, uh, out of, I think, eight, eight races after uh, Paul Ricard. But, man... From Austria all the way until like Singapore, we had good to great races. From Austria with Max's uh, famous win after a, a horrible start and pretty much, of course, um, uh, gained the win on the penultimate lap of uh, that battle with, of course, uh, Charles Leclerc. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, the next race, Silverstone. Once again, another battle between uh, Leclerc and Verstappen. I'll give you the better battle because it lasted longer. Uh, and of course, uh, Mercedes had a bit of a battle before in the end, Hamilton got the edge of Bottas because of the because of the safety car. And of course, uh, Seb uh, <laughs> crashed into uh, this happened, unfortunately. <sighs> Dear God. Um, uh, and then of course, Germany. The, the best race of the season for me. And will always be. And it's, uh, that is a fact. Uh, I don't care what people say. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, pretty much everything happened in that race, from raining to uh, uh, the, that drag strip, which pretty much took many drivers out, including, of course, uh, Leclerc and Hamilton. Sainz also got uh, 
a uh, victim. He's also a victim of that drag strip, but he did survive. Uh, the same with Kimi Rockin, though Kimi didn't spin, he just ran right into the gravel, really. Well, unfortunately, well, uh, of course, Nico Hogan, but probably is the most heartbreaking one because, once again, another uh, another chance of a podium slipped away. Ah, uh, Hulk. Why? Uh, and then, of course, uh, Oh yeah, and of course uh, the podium. Uh, Vettel, of course, probably one of the drafts of the season, starting from last place uh, to finish uh, second, and then and then Daniel Kvyat, the torpedo, of course, uh, returning his first year after um, after an absent from 20, 2018. Of course, podium. Uh, of course, uh, last stroll in the racing point, finish fourth after a brilliant strategy call from uh, racing. From uh, the racing point uh, strategist, you know, a, a strategist that I wish Ferrari really do have, uh, and and uh, and of course, uh, yeah, it's pretty much crazy shit happened. Uh, and oh yeah, uh, Williams is only point of the season. <laughs> With, uh, well, through luck because well, Kimi and Gio got post race penalties for I think using illegal. Uh, something illegal at the start of the race so yeah it was a crazy race Hungary battle of course between Lewis and Max pretty much uh, Lewis beat Max because Mark pretty much outfoxed Red Bull Spa of course midfield Galores uh, Monza Leclerc pretty much fending off the Mercedes successfully and of course uh, Singapore where once again crazy midfield battle and said win of the season which uh, made uh, Charles not pleased at all uh, yeah which is probably why some people don't really like him now but that's another topic and of course a rare thing happened Ferrari got a strategy right and Mercedes uh, butchered it my god can't believe that happened but uh, yeah yeah there you go a run of I think around seven races uh, where it's a great to good race, especially Germany. Still, in my opinion, one of the best of all time that I've ever seen. They they were brilliant races, and I I would include you got to include Brazil in that. That that was a, a fantastic race yeah. as well. Um, yes, it, it was a shame that there was no kind of championship uh, fight within it. But the midfield battle has been brilliant. There's been some great on track action. I think it's been one of the best seasons in the decade in terms of on track battling and on track fighting throughout the field. And obviously that kind of mix of the old guard generation of Lewis Hamilton uh, versus the new guard in terms of the Verstappens, the Leclercs, uh, and obviously Verstappen and Leclerc versus each other. And then at times, you know, the rookies coming through, the album getting promoted to the Red Bull seat, Lando Norris having a really impressive season at McLaren. There was a lot to be really excited about by this season, and it, it was a fantastic season. Yeah, it really is, especially in terms of racing. Like, here's the thing about Brazil, though. Like, I actually think the Brazilian race was actually, like, I don't know, a... A six out of ten race most of the time until of course in the end with the are you fucking kidding me uh <laughs> a ten race at the end a bit like uh, brazil 2008 but of course not as dramatic as well that race basically decided the title still hurt me uh <laughs> but yeah no i i, it was, uh, really I, good in terms I, of I can racing. see that in terms of a race that that I, there were still battles within it and i, I like the kind of the fight between Max and Lewis Rout. There was the Bottas Leclerc fight that never quite materialised before his engine failure kicked in, but there were still some good midfield battles. But yeah, the end was an yeah. incredible part of that Brazilian Grand Prix. And yeah, it was absolutely mental. But um, I'll go on to pitch my 2016. So why 2016 edges it for 2019 for me is because it did have a title battle. And it was the first kind of inter-team rivalry that had gone right down to the last race uh, between teammates where they were the sole focus uh, since since a Prost and Senna type of rivalry uh, back in the late 80s with McLaren. And 
you know, it was fantastic to watch because of the animosity that had built up over the previous three seasons between Nico and uh, Hamilton and just how it kind of acclimatised there. Hamilton suffered from some mistakes. Um, it was just how it kind of... There was a real animosity between the two and there were collisions. Obviously, Spain was the big collision late on. It went down to the last race. Uh <laughs> Funnily enough, Abu Dhabi, probably, we said earlier, 2010 was one of the better Abu Dhabi season finales in 2016. But the reason that they were good season finales was because the drivers couldn't overtake. So, uh, yeah, I obviously, Fernando couldn't overtake Vitaly Petrov in 2010. And people couldn't get past Nico Rosberg to stop him winning the championship. In um, he had a 13 point lead I believe going into the final race but it was quite funny because you had Lewis Hamilton just trying to back and slow everything up to kind of bring others into the race to kind of overtake but he was warned obviously against this because uh, they, they were worried about losing the race win to Sebastian Vettel as well at that case uh, in the Ferrari but yeah it was a very weird kind of thing and probably Lewis's most tense season because uh yeah I think he's always reasonably got on well with teammates obviously Fernando Alonso in his rookie year wasn't uh, a highlight relationship back in 2007 uh sorry 2000 and yeah 2007 um <laughs> but yeah, it was just a real kind of fiery thing. And I think it had drama. And with it going down to the last race, with Nico Rosberg uh, claiming that title and then retiring five days later, uh, it was just a really dramatic season for me. Uh, and probably, yeah, th the best title fight that we've had in the hybrid era. Yeah, I can... Uh... <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I can see why uh, you think that way, because... Um... Yeah, it is a very intriguing title fight, especially with with that season being, of course, the third chapter of the Lewis uh, versus uh, Rosberg rivalry. Um, you know, uh, you know that that team at the time is already so toxic that you know even Toto Wolff himself already admitted that he almost he uh, he almost uh, broke that team up at the end of 2015 because, of course, it got too toxic. But of course, it doesn't really matter because Mercedes is pretty much in front of everyone, so no one can take advantage. But uh, yeah, it was a great. Uh, it was a, a very tense finale indeed. Of course, Hamilton, of course, breaking team orders. You know, you know, because of course he's in it for himself. And of course, uh, Seb, of course, almost actually got the win in a, in a race where Ferrari got the strategy right. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah, of course. Seb in the end didn't overtake uh, both of them because he said himself to the radio he doesn't want to get involved with the uh, in the title of White Zone and he had to stay in, in uh, of course, third. Of course, um, Nico, of course, won. As you can tell, Hamilton, let's be honest, he's not, he, he was really upset about this as um, uh, we, uh, we saw uh, down the road because pretty much he uh, he always has a bitterness with, uh, of course, uh, Rosberg. Uh, but yes, but pretty much uh, Hamilton wasn't able to get his revenge on Rosberg because pretty much he's like, you know, after he won the championship, as you can tell, of course, you already told me, of course, he retired. You know, a bit like a, you know, uh, uh, telling the sign to lose, like, uh, yeah, screw you, uh, you know, going to the sunset, pretty much. Um, uh, but yeah, once again, that that rivalry is uh, it's a very good rivalry to watch. Yeah, it was it was a fantastic, I think, rivalry to watch, and it is quite nice when you have guys. I don't know if they're just civil with each other now, but certainly during that time, although they had competed growing up against each other and had been friends, they certainly uh, weren't friends by the end of um, twenty sixteen, and it was really a kind of yet yeah, fantastic scene of battle. I think Lewis was most frustrated because he felt he hadn't lost on merit to Rosberg, um, but it had mainly been down to kind of car reliability issues. Uh, although there were some driver mistakes 
from him within there as well. Obviously, Spain, when he took uh, each of them out, but and then there was a race later on in the season where Lewis was able to carry on and win the race, uh, but Nico damaged his front wing, dropping down to fourth and then got a 20-second penalty post-race for causing a collision. So, um, yeah, it, it was just lots of kind of it really tense between them, and it was really great to watch. Had a, uh, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think he had, like, a, I think a brake problem. Hamilton, of course, uh, I think... Uh, no, no, actually... Wait. Oh, God, I forgot. I think Rosberg's on the inside, and he pretty much just turned to Hamilton. Yeah. And, then of course, damaged his front wing. Yeah, yeah, he did. And, of course, he dropped back to fourth because, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Verstappen and Raikkonen overtook him. Yep, they did. Uh, before the finish line. Uh, and, of course, he did get that 20-second penalty, but it didn't really affect anything, really. He, he still actually finished fourth, so that did save Rosberg a bit. But, yeah, but of course, uh, can I say more about Hamilton's mistakes? Of course, yeah, of course, you can put down to car re- reliability issues. But, of course, uh, you cannot forget his starts. My God, he made so many bad starts throughout that season. And that really, that you could say that cost him a lot because... As a result, he was forced to fight uh, some drivers, uh, you know, going through, going through the field because of that, because of those terrible starts. Exactly, and and when you start further back, you always run the risk, and you your race isn't quite as clean as what it is when you're able to lead from the front and just put in laps. But I think we've probably put our cases forward for the four seasons, so we'll move on to conclusions and. Um, for you, Viandra, what is the best uh, season of the decade? Uh, for me, the best is, I uh, still maintain this, even though back then I was like only 9 or 10. It's it's 2012 in my opinion, because, you know, it's, you know, it's the season where everything just happened from midfield teams actually can, can get podiums uh, on any race not just being lucky, uh, you know, to, of course, seven different race winners, uh, six world champions being on the grid, Alonso having, you know, probably his best season ever, Kimi Räikkönen, great comeback season, no doubt, uh, you know, McLaren's awful, awful reliability despite having the best car for most of the season, and, uh, and of course, a brilliant uh, finale, and, of course, another additional four or five great races. Yeah, and for me, it was 2012 as well. I do agree with you. I just, I think the title fight between Vettel and Alonso was the most exciting and intriguing. Having those kind of, um, there were some brilliant races within it as well, uh, which was fantastic. Those seven different race winners at the start of the season, Michael Schumacher's last pole position. Uh, yeah, the return of Kimi Räikkönen and the Lotus being competitive uh, at times. It was just, yeah, it, it was really fascinating to watch. And, you know, it, it was a mix. You had those kind of podiums uh, from different teams as well. Obviously, you had Nico Hulkenberg's heartbreaking uh, collision with Lewis Hamilton uh, there, which was his last chance uh, well, he thinks a race win, and I certainly think a podium uh, was on from him there in terms of they just obviously going past the back markers. Uh, they both lost a little bit of control and, yeah, ended both their races. But was an absolute brilliant season, had everything for me. Well, no, actually, well, no, actually Hulk, Hulk actually still finished, but, you know, he, he didn't get the podium. But, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm... Yeah, sorry. He, he continued. Uh, Lewis was out, wasn't he? He beached on the gravel. Um, no, 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 actually, he um, he got a damage suspension, I think, in his last race for McLaren as well. I know. Oh, dear. Poor Luke. A sad way to go out and to start a new era. But yes, uh, it was just yeah an absolutely fantastic season and loved watching it. And it was what we want in terms of drama going down to the last race of the season. And when, when the season finishes where you can have at least two drivers able to win the championship in the last race. That's what makes it uh, fantastic. But 
Viandra, thank you very much for coming on and discussing that. That is our concluding thoughts, guys. Do you agree with us in the comments below? If there is another season uh, that you think we missed out, that you thought was the best season of the decade, pitch it in the comments below. Um, but yeah, hope you have enjoyed that, Viandra. Um, yeah, did you enjoy coming on? Uh, yeah, I really, uh, I really did enjoy it. Uh, really did enjoy it. And uh, yeah, maybe someday I'll... I'll come on again maybe someday, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> You'll always be welcome to come on. We always enjoy talking F1. And this is why uh, we started this podcast is because F1 is a sport that's supported by people all over the world. And uh, it's just great to chat to people and uh, to have conversations about Formula One. And yeah, it was a fantastic track today and really enjoyed it and guys if you have liked this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up uh, like i said comment down below on uh, your thoughts on the season on our winner was it a different winner for you was there another season we missed out comment down below on that and if you are new around here don't forget to subscribe to the channel click that bell notification and you can keep up to date with all our latest content and watch more videos just like this one um, but thank you very much again, Viandra. Thank you guys for listening. And for now, UF1 yeah. fans, keep racing. <laughs>